Right, this is lesson two in paper one of Excel, and we're covering today why do people want change in the year 1785 to 1815. So last lesson we started looking at how people voted in Britain and as time went on people began to demand change as Britain was changing as a country which caused all sorts of threats to the government and remember the government were very elitist they, at the top you had the aristocratic wealthy people who earned the vote because of their holding of land. Now, this became a problem as, as England grew and people who demanded more democratic say, a democratic say in, in politics. So, to start the lesson, this is, this is your, uh, your task as a starter. I want you to think about what we did last lesson and answer the following questions. You can write the question down and the answer or you can write the answer in full sentences. So question one, how many MPs did each constituency get in England? Question two, in the counties, how much did your property need to be worth to vote? Question three, what is a Scotton lot? Number four, what is a rotten borough? Bonus points if anyone can give me examples of rotten boroughs. Number five, give three reasons why the voting system in England was flawed. That means not very good. Six, why was the lack of a secret ballot a problem in England? Number six gives you an answer for number five, just a little hint there. Number seven, when was the importance of the areas decided and why was this a problem? So if you were a borough, etc., cetera, um, when, would, when was the importance of the areas decided? And then number eight, what was going on in England during this time that meant lots of change was happening? If you pause the video here, then you can start these questions, spend about five, ten minutes answering them, and it's good recall based on what we did last lesson, a key skill that you need to develop at A-level. So if we go back to what the exam board want. These bullet points seem very short, but we can turn some of these bullet points into five, six, seven lessons. So last lesson, you already looked at the unreformed parliament, the critics and the pre-reform electorate, parliamentary seats and election. Demands for reform is going to be the cover of this lesson and the lesson after. And we're also going to touch upon the political demands of the manufacturing interests. So after about three lessons, we would have covered the first bullet point. Now, some of these are a lot more detailed as you go on through the A-level. So, I have given you an example here. Now, the first thing you need to know is that the essays at A-level are all 20 marks, okay? They are a lot more detailed than GCSE, but the key thing is there is a certain, there are certain ways to answer them, but there's a little bit more freedom at A-level about how you go about answering questions. The top A-level students will have more of an opinion throughout their essays. So I've given you a question here that actually by the end of this, I'd like you to give it a go. I'll tell you when I want you to answer it. But it says, to what extent was the government's lack of reform down to the fear of revolution? If we were going to word this into a how far do you agree question like GCSE, you might have a question saying, the fear of revolution was the main reason why the government did not, um, did not go ahead with reform in the year 1785 to 1820. How far do you agree? You don't have that wording at A-level. It will be, be questions like, to what extent? Or it, there will be different wording. Now, I'm just going to go through paper one, and you'll get this a lot more in, in the new academic year. But this style of question, you would get an A-level paper and in paper one you, you have to answer three questions in two hours and 15 minutes. In section A you have to answer an essay question where you get a choice of two. In section B you have to answer an essay question where you get a choice of two. And in section C you have to do an interpretation question where the topic will always be about the abolition of the slave trade. The interpretation question is very similar to the one that you did in the Germany paper uh, the 16 marker on that paper. Now in this lesson and for the next couple of lessons we're going to be looking at why the government didn't change the way which people voted in this period and then you're going to come to a developed written response which will allow you to come to an overall conclusion. 
So, I'm going to start with some of the information. If you have a look on the other side, it says there were so many problems with the system of voting that there were several attempts to promote reform in Parliament. So because there were so many things wrong with how people voted and why people could vote, there were lots of, there were lots of different ways in which people tried to change this. Remember, lack of secret ballot, you've got rotten boroughs, you've got pocket boroughs, you've got the elitist aristocracy. You could only vote if you were a rich male landowner. People wanted to change that. So groups were already set up before 1785 to attempt to change things. So before this course starts, people were trying to change the way in which people voted. So, for example, in 1780, the Society for Constitutional Information was set up. And it was set to change, cause change through peaceful methods. But the Gordon riots of 1780 scared the wealthier classes and made them turn away from change. In a minute, you're going to, you know, this will be one of your first tasks to look at the Gordon riots and still a little bit of research. Now, in 1785, this is where our course starts. Prime Minister William Pitt attempted to reform Parliament the voting system by disenfranchising, and that means taking away seats from 36 boroughs and giving them to someone else. Now, why would this be good? I'm gonna add something in here. William Pitt aimed to take away seats. So I'll just add this here. Pitt wanted to take away seats from areas which were not important anymore. He wanted to take away 36, he wanted to disenfranchise 36 boroughs, which have, would have released a vast amount of seats, 72, if my maths is correct. And he wanted to give them to someone else. So he wanted to give them to more important areas. But it was rejected. As you can see there, it was rejected by 74 votes. Now, let's have a think. Why would disenfranchising 36 boroughs actually have been a positive thing? But if the more important places got MPs, then the country would have had a broader political system. But by keeping the old rotten and pocket boroughs, it means that power stays with one group with the rich, wealthy landowners. Now, this was because a lot of MPs, members of parliament, were not motivated to change a system that they benefited from. One of the biggest reasons why there was little change in the, in the, um, in the political system in this period was because rich people were scared of losing their power. So, in this circumstance, you could argue that MPs were very selfish. You could argue that MPs wanted to keep their position in power, but also MPs didn't want change because they genuinely thought that they were the best people for the job because they were rich, because they were wealthy, because they were knowing. They thought they were the best people to take the country forward. On top of this, if things did change, they might lose um, influence in the House of Commons, they might lose influence in the House of Lords, and in turn, it might create a new democratic system which they would not have wanted. So the first task, first of all, research the Gordon Riots and find out five facts about it. Secondly, why would Pitt disenfranchising 36 boroughs have caused lots of positive change? Remember, it didn't happen but let's think about what would have happened if it was passed. And then number three, why do you think MPs didn't want to change the current system in 1785? Try and think of three reasons there and explain it. If you pause the video here and then you can really develop the understanding of the context of this before we look at more detail. Right, now this is a bit more difficult. And there will be bits of this that you don't truly understand, but that's absolutely fine. If you look at the top at the start, keywords, we'll look at a few of these keywords. So conservative, if you're conservative, you don't like change or you like to stick to tradition. 
Now, in this period, 1785 to 18, uh, in the mid-1800s, you had two political groups. You had the Whigs and you had the Conservatives. Now, Whigs were a political group who were focused on the interests of the middle class. And the middle class are people who are wealthy, not massively wealthy, but they're comfortable. As England grew and as factories developed, the middle class became a really important group of people, which we'll talk about when we look at the reform. You also had the Conservatives, who were a political group who focused on tradition and religious, and religious sorry, intolerance. So the Conservatives, obviously you know that we have a Conservative party in our country today. This is a party whose, whose ideas have changed over time. But in this course, the Conservatives were a traditional group who didn't like too much change. So, what we're going to look at with this part is what was the French Revolution and what impact did it have on the British system? Now, the French Revolution was a really big reason why the British government didn't want to change things. So, the French Revolution is an event which caused demand for change in Britain. Now, in 1789, revolution in France broke out which led to the overthrow of the aristocratic rule. So the, the people overthrew the aristocratic monarchy. Due to this, people in Britain began to question the system of parliament in the country with the concern they were being, quote, ruled by the rich. So this led to conservative politicians and others who benefited from it standing up for the system in Britain. So to put that into context, People in Britain saw what was happening in France or heard what was happening in France and they believed that actually the system in Britain was outdated, that they were being ruled by rich aristocratic people who weren't thinking about them. This made the government fearful. So it meant that the conservative politicians began to stand up for what they thought was a good system. Now, the main argument that these people were saying was that the system did not need changing because it was working well. The government said that during the time of this system, Britain went through many successes. So they had uh, wars which they won against Napoleon. And they also went through industrial development of the country, which made them very rich. Now, this, could, those who supported the system in England said that after the revolution in France, they went through a reign of terror. So people believed that if there was change in England, that England would go through this, this horrific terror stage where people became unruly and people would break the law and people would cause problems. So the people that stood up for this and want, didn't want change said, if we change things, this country will get worse, okay? Now, another thing that the conservative politicians said was that Britain was a strong country who didn't need to change the system. But what it did do, what the French Revolution did do, was show the government a what-if situation. What if people became that unhappy? Well, it could be a similar situation. So the government had to dis defend the system of voting. And as time goes on, Anyone that goes against it, the government become, becomes very strict with. And we're going to look at that later on when we look at the different uh, protests that occurred, which the government had to step in with. Now, one of the most significant supporters of the voting system as it was, was a man called Edmund Burke. Now, Burke wrote a book called Reflections on the Revolution in France. And in this book, he said that if the reason that the French Revolution happened was because of radical political change. Because of this radical change, people felt confident to overthrow the aristocracy. Now, what Edmund Burke said, he said that the British system was so strong because it was slow and able to adapt, which allowed it to succeed because it was based on tradition. And those who were elected as MPs were the best people in society to run the country. Burke is a traditional, classic conservative. And if you just look at the quote from his book, it says, our constitution is a constitution whose sole authority is that it has existed time out of mind. That means it's existed for such a long time and it's worked. It is a presumption in favour of any settled scheme 
of government against any untried project that a nation has long flourished under it. Basically, what he's saying there is our system works. And if we do change it, we could go down the route of France. Nobody wanted, especially those rich, wealthy landowners who held all the power. Now, this is a bit of a fun task, um, I hope. I want you to imagine that you are a conservative politician who supports the voting system in England. I want you to write a half a page speech explaining why the current system in England works. Now, to make this a historically accurate speech, I want you to refer to the works of Edmund Burke and the events in France and explain what you think the best parts of the current system are. Your job in this speech is to convince other people that this system is the best system that works and be able to develop the ideas of what in their mind works. And you really need to get into the shoes of these conservative politicians to get them to, to get yourself to understand why they were so protective over their voting system in England. At this you can take a few minutes to get your head around it, go through this information, jot down what you would prefer as a conservative politician, and then just write about a half a page speech. It doesn't need to be too long. Focus on why you protect your system of voting in England. Now, even though conservative politicians wanted things to stay the same, what needs to be understood is that there, was, there were threats to the government in the year 1785 to 1815 to try and get them to change um, the reform, to reform, sorry, the system of voting. So there's two factors to look at in this time period. And in the next lesson, we'll look at the last five years because something happened in the year 1785 to 1815, which actually means change didn't happen that much. So the first guy to look at is a man called Thomas Paine. Now, Thomas Paine wrote and also wrote a book similar to Edmund Burke. But what Thomas Paine wrote about was totally different to what Edmund Burke had written about. Thomas Paine wrote a book called Rights of Man, and it was a response to Edmund Burke's book, for Reflections in the Revolution of France. Now, Paine was totally against the current system, and he wrote about how humans, how human beings deserved rights. And he asked for significant reform, with rule by the people being one of his biggest demands. Rights of man criticised the, mon the monarchy and discussed the serious corruption which existed in the political spectrum. The reason this was a threat was because this book sold 200,000 copies by 1793, and it encouraged a raft of young um, reformers to actually get involved in trying to push change through in England. Thomas Paine was a significant threat. The reason is his book spread so quickly and it had a very radical message to change the parliamentary system. Societies were also quite a threat to the government. Now, there were two societies in particular that threatened the government in this time. You had the Sheffield Society for Constitutional Information in 1791 and you had the London Corresponding Society in 1792. Now, the point of these groups was to gain reform by making people aware through pamphlets. So peaceful methods are pamphlets like a leaflet, but also more assertive methods, which might have scared the government because it would remind them of the French Revolution. Now, 1792, the Sheffield Society had a 10,000 signature petition calling for male suffrage, votes for all men. That's going to scare the government potentially because that in their eyes, 10,000 people are demanding change. But in 1795, the LCS, the London Corresponding Society, set up a demonstration at Copenhagen Fields, which attracted 100,000 people. That again, if you're the government, you're gonna be scared at that potential of a revolution. This was the more assertive. A demonstration can become very volatile very quickly. So having that many people in one place could have gone incredibly badly for the government, depending on the way in which the LCS wanted to go. Now, these groups were a serious concern across the country because the support they were getting and what it reminded the government of was the French Revolution. OK, 
but both these people and groups struggled to get support and change in this period. Why? Well, in 1793, the French Republic declared war on England. And in England, in this period, if a period of war occurred, people would feel very patriotic towards their country. They wouldn't want to go against their government in a time of crisis. So this made the current system, the, the, the parliamentary system, strong again because people stopped turning on the government and went on their side. Now, on top of this, during the war with France, the government did become stricter. The government introduced the Treason Act of 1795, which put the death penalty in place for anyone who had political meetings or published seditious materials that threatened the government. Now, seditious material is, is a, like an angry, a volatile, threatening piece. And anyone that did that could be punished with the death penalty. With the war with France and the threat from the government, reforming pressure went down. It went quiet for a while. And individuals such as Francis Burdett and William Cobbett could not change anything during this time of war. Reform got replaced by patriotism. People wanted to support the government rather than turn on them. From the last slide, there's two tasks and then you're done with this, uh, this lesson today. Number one, why, who would you argue was a bigger threat to the government of England? Thomas Paine or the societies? Explain why. Just do a peel paragraph on that. And then I want you to begin a spider diagram that you're going to continue next lesson. The title of the spider diagram is, why did reform not happen in the year 1785 to 1815? Add anything you think as to why the government did not change anything in this time period. So I'll, give, I'll start you off a reason why uh, things didn't change. You can put, during the war with France, the government became strict and introduced the Treason Act of 1795, and then just explain why that would cause a lack of reform. Aim for seven to nine reasons, but if you get five reasons, that's fine. You're going to add to this next lesson to be able to develop it further. So next lesson, what we're gonna cover, we're gonna look at the, what happened after the war with France in 1815. We're gonna look at the Peterloo massacre, and we're gonna also look at the, the demands of the newly created middle class, the manufactured interests. So if you work through all these tasks and then pop the work to me and then I can have a look and mark it. If you've got any questions, just let me know.